A teacher has a class of students, represented by these circles. Some of the students are able to work together well, indicated by a white line drawn between them. But other pairs of students misbehave when working together, represented by the absence of a connection. The teacher says, Today we're doing project work. You can either work by yourself or in a pair. What the teacher has just invented is a matching. A matching is which of those white lines end up being used to make pairs of students that work together. For example, if these two students end up working together, then this white line is part of the matching, so I'll colour it orange to show that. The other students will all work on their own in the project. The same class can have lots of matchings. This is also a matching, and so is this. But this isn't a matching, because this student is supposed to be in two pairs at once. And this isn't a matching either, because this pair of students don't work well together. Let's now get a bit more formal. The circles are called vertices, the lines are called edges, and the cl entire classroom is called a graph. This idea of matchings is therefore widely applicable, and not just the students in a class. The same exact graph can have lots of different matchings. For example, this graph has this matching with one edge, this one also with one edge, this one still with one edge, this one with two edges, and even the empty matching. In our original example, this is where every student chooses to work alone on the project. Our goal is to make the matching as big as possible. Let's say the teacher thinks working in pairs is more educational than working alone, and leads to less marking. A matching with the largest possible number of edges in it is called a maximum matching, and in this case it's the one with two pairs, so only one student has to work alone. One thing we might try is to start by randomly picking an edge, and then to keep adding edges randomly to the matching until it's impossible to add any more. Clearly, if it's possible to add another edge to the matching, then it wasn't maximum, because we just made a bigger one. Surprisingly though, the converse is not true. It's possible to have a matching where you can't add any more edges to it, but it's still not maximum. The key insight is that sometimes removing an edge from the matching allows you to add many more in return. For example, take this graph of four vertices and three edges. This matching, of size one, cannot be improved by adding any edges. The two remaining students don't have an edge between them, so can't work together. But if we instead remove this edge from the matching, suddenly every vertex can be involved in the matching, like this. A matching where you can't add any more edges is called maximal. Don't confuse it with maximum. All maximum matchings are maximal, but not all maximal matchings are maximum. How then do we find maximum matchings? Let's say that we've already found a matching. It doesn't matter if it's maximum or maximal or anything like that. An alternating path is a path which alternates between matched and unmatched edges. For example, this one goes matched, unmatched, matched. This is another alternating path. It goes unmatched, matched, unmatched, matched. It doesn't matter if you start with a matched or an unmatched edge, and it doesn't matter how long the path is. Some alternating paths are interesting. Take a look at an alternating path which starts and ends at an unmatched vertex, a vertex which has no orange edges coming out of it. Let's count how many edges are not in the matching. One, two, three. And how many are in the matching? There are two. Now take a look at what happens when we flip the matched and unmatched edges. Now there are three matched edges and two unmatched edges. In other words, the number of matched edges increased by one. Therefore, an alternating path which starts and ends at an unmatched vertex is called an augmenting path, because you can use it to augment the matching, that is, make it bigger, using this flipping procedure. Indeed, notice that the same logic applies to an augmenting path of length one. Initially, it has no matched edges, but after augmenting along it, it increases to one matched edge. We've seen that if an augmenting path with respect to the current matching is present in the graph, the matching is not maximum, because you can make it bigger by flipping the matched and unmatched edges. But what if there is no augmenting path in the graph? Last time, we had an issue, where just because the matching is maximal, you can't make it bigger just by adding more edges to it, it doesn't mean it's maximum. Is it the same here, that if there's no augmenting path, then we have to use a different strategy to find a bigger matching, but one might still exist? No. It turns out that if there are no augmenting paths with respect to the current matching in a graph, that means that the matching is maximum. We'll now prove this together, and the proof is actually rather clever. First, let's take our current, smaller matching, and call it S for smaller. We'll colour the matched edges orange as usual. Now for any given graph, there might be lots of different maximum matchings, all of the same size. So let's pick a random maximum matching, and call it B for big. Assume that S is smaller than B, meaning that S is not a maximum matching itself. And now let's take S and B, and create a new graph, by combining the matched edges of S and B. We'll take the vertices from our graph, and then only draw an edge if that edge appears in either S or B. If it appears in both, we'll draw that edge twice. So let's start by penciling in the orange edge from S, which does not also appear in B. Next, let's draw the two blue edges from the maximum matching B. 
and finally let's add the shared edge from S and B. We can use this stripey colouring to indicate that the edge is included twice. So we're about to prove that one of these connected components contains an augmenting pass in S. In this case, it's actually this one. We'll do this by considering what each of the connected components of the combined graph is allowed to look like, where the three connected components of this graph are the subgraphs induced by this vertex, these four vertices, and these two vertices. Firstly, it might be that the connected component is an isolated vertex, but it might also have an edge coming out of it, say orange. It might also have a second edge coming out of it, but that second edge cannot also be orange, or else the orange matching would ask the same student to be in two pairs at once, so the other edge will be blue. There cannot be a third edge, because whatever colour you choose, it will either contradict that S is a matching, or that B is a matching, by making the student be in two pairs at once. So now that we know this, there are two possible cases of what could happen as we follow a path from a vertex. Either it just ends somewhere, or it loops back around and forms a cycle. But notice that if it does end up forming a cycle, the last connection has to be of the opposite colour, meaning that there is an equal number of orange and blue edges. If it were an odd length cycle, like on the left, then if you colour it orange, this vertex is in two pairs at once according to the S matching. And if you colour it blue, this vertex is in two pairs at once according to the B matching. Technically, there's one more case. If we drew the same edge twice, once from S and once from B, then can there be any more to this connected component? If it has an orange edge coming out from it, then the corresponding edges in the S matching must both be orange too, so S wouldn't be a matching. And similarly, if it instead had a blue edge coming out from it, then exactly the same argument could be made, that if you look at what our supposed maximum matching is, is then it's not really a matching at all, because it puts the same student in two different pairs at the same time. Now, notice that all the matched edges from S and from B are represented in the combined graph, so for B to be a bigger matching, there must be more blue edges than orange edges here. So which connected components account for the difference in edges? It can't be the isolated vertices, they don't have any edges in them. And the overlapping edges also can't explain the difference, since there's one of each type of edge there. Maybe the difference is in the even length cycles. But each e vertex in the cycle will have one orange edge and one blue edge attached to it. So in total, the cycle will have an equal number of matched and unmatched edges. So by process of elimination, we know that the only connected components which account for the difference in size between S and B are the paths. At least one of the paths must have more blue edges than orange edges, if we would have any hope of there being more blue edges than orange edges overall. Now there are three types of alternating paths, one where both endpoints are matched in the orange graph, one where the endpoints are opposite, and one where both endpoints are matched in the blue graph. But notice that the only one which is capable of causing there to be more blue edges than orange edges is the last one. And furthermore, this path is precisely an augmenting path in S, because all the blue edges must be white in S, since otherwise they would be stripy, not blue in this diagram, and the endpoints are unmatched in S, because otherwise there would be an orange or stripy edge coming out of them in the combined graph. Thus, whenever a matching is not maximum, there will always be an augmenting path to make it bigger. And it should be stressed that this isn't how we find augmenting paths, it's just a proof that one will exist when a matching isn't maximum. So this video has given a proof of Burge's lemma. I'm sorry it's a bit rushed towards the end, and could have done with some more animations. It was made for the Summer of Math Exposition 1, and details, attribution, and corrections are available in the description. I hope to make more content about computer science on this channel, varying from theoretical computer science to cybersecurity and programming, and in particular thought that this would be a useful contribution, because Burge's lemma is assumed in many algorithms, and we programmers often like to skip over the proofs to get to the meat of the actual programming.